Revelation chapter number 20, if you have your Bibles. Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter number 20. I'm going to read two verses here, Revelation chapter number 20, verses 14 and 15. Revelation 20, verses 14 and 15. The Bible says, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. I'm going to talk to you this morning about a lovely subject from our lovely Savior, a place called hell. Father, thank you again for loving us. Please bless this Bible study. Thank you, Lord, for these dear folks that are here on a cold, early January morning. I pray for safety for those still coming. Thank you for being such a good God, such a gracious, long-suffering, merciful, forgiving God. Dear God, help us to believe these verses we're about to read this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. This is a subject, a topic most people obviously stay away from. Um, it's not a popular subject to talk about. But this is the only reason why we have church. Now when I say the only reason, I'm not saying hell is the most important subject. But this is the only reason we have church. We don't have church because it's a, it's a uh, good place to, to visit. We don't have church because uh, we want to join a religion. We don't come to church because we want to be, uh, we want to fit in. Some people do. I'm not saying that they don't. That's not the purpose of church though. In all things in life, you ought to go to the end and walk back. Like your focus ought to be when you're in high school, you're having to test an exam. So you study and you cram and you memorize for what reason? For that final exam. For the believer, it's the judgment seat of Christ. It's very clear that you and I as saved people are going to stand before a holy God and we're going to give an account. Everything we've ever done, everything we've ever said, and everything we've ever thought of, you and I are going to give an account. That's for lost, that's, those, that's for saved people, the judgment seat of Christ. For lost people, though, they're going to stand before the holy, same holy God at what the Bible calls the great white throne judgment, well, where they will be judged for all their sins because they rejected Jesus Christ as their Savior. Upon their death, they go to a place called hell. When time wraps up, all those people that are now in hell because they've rejected Jesus Christ are going to be brought out of hell to stand and give an account for their sins at the great white throne judgment. And at that great white throne judgment, when their sins are revealed and the rejection of the Lord Jesus Christ then these two verses will apply. And death, well, let's go to verse number, uh, uh, verse 11. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. 
The vast majority of churches have shun away from this subject. The vast majority of churches don't even believe in this subject. When you get the probably the most famous, most well-known Baptist preacher in American history, Billy Graham, to deny the existence of fire and hell, that tells you how far America has gone from the Word of God. And so when you hear people compliment or praise the Billy Graham, oh, I went to a Billy Graham revival, I went to his crusade, I listened to him on the radio, on the television, and uh, I used to listen to Billy Graham all the time. Anybody that tells you that there's no fire in hell has denied the Lord Jesus Christ, ladies and gentlemen. Has I'm just telling you, we're going to read the verses that Jesus spoke more about hell than he did about heaven. There's a real place called heaven, and thank God for heaven. And thank God that when you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, he saves you from hell that has fire and takes us to heaven. Thank God for heaven. Thank God that when we trust Christ to be our Savior, we're born again, we're sealed, we've gone through those verses, we're eternally secure. But I think most times we, even as a church, forget that we're saved from hell. You see, if you really believed that you were saved from hell, and if you really believe that lost people were on their way to hell, if you really believe that your loved ones were one breath from hell and the lake of fire, you would change the way you live. You would change the, your life. You would change your mind. You would change your heart. You would change your direction. But you, generally as a church, generally as America, we have rejected the love of God. And this is why people don't love people. They don't realize, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one to another. Anytime any believer, and they, I'm telling you, believers hate other people too. This is not just for the world. Anytime a, a church person, a saved person, when they're backslidden or stubborn or rebellious, what they have lost focus of is the last judgment that they're going to stand before God. And then after the judgment for the, for the believer, you're going to see loved ones cast into the lake of fire, man. You're going to see neighbors and friends and co-workers and family and church people Can you imagine as you see them being cast into the lake of fire, turning to you while you're witnessing this scene, and they'll say to you, why didn't you tell me? I ask you, what, what answer will you say? Because I was too envious at somebody. I was too angry at somebody. I was too upset at somebody. I just wanted to have a cold heart. I wanted to be selfish. And so for all eternity, people are going to be burning in the lake of fire because God's people have cold hearts. God's people are stubborn and rebellious and lazy. They're uncaring. This is why we have church. To remind you there's a place called hell. To remind you there's a place where people today are still burning in hell. Not for one day or one week or one month or one year or ten years. But for all eternity. If it's not true, close up the book, close the doors, let's go home. Let's go hunting and let's go fishing. Let's go overthrow the government, shall we? I mean, if there's no place called hell, if there wasn't a man named Jesus who was God in the flesh and came and died on the cross, we're wasting our time. This is all in vain. This is a futile effort. But if there's a place called hell, I suggest you tell everybody about Jesus Christ. If there's a place like we're going to read this morning from the lips of the Lord Jesus Christ, if there's a real place called hell, I decide, I would urge you to get right with God.
Deuteronomy 32, 22 says, A fire is kindled in mine anger and shall burn unto the lowest hell. 2 Samuel 22, verse 6, and Psalm 18, 5 talks about the sorrows in hell. In Job 26, 6, it says hell is naked. In Psalm 9, verse number 17, the Bible says the wicked shall be turned into hell. In Psalm 116, verse 3, the pains of hell get hold upon me. In Psalm 139, verse 8, it says, If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. People are going to remember for all eternity as they're burning in hell that they've rejected Jesus Christ. We play games and favorites. We have pity parties and we're selfish. God's, I'm talking about God's people. You know, we don't mind preaching against the sodomites, the queers, and the faggots, you know. We don't mind preaching against the communists and the Marxists and the anti-American. We don't, we don't mind preaching against that stuff. But it really bothers us when the preacher preaches against us being cold-hearted, lazy, uncaring for the lost. I'm not, I'm not pastoring a church or preaching from a pulpit because I had nothing else better to do in my life. I, I don't spend my time preparing sermons or Bible studies or preaching or soul winning or doing funerals or weddings or counseling people because I have nothing else better to do in my life. The one focus I have in my life that I'm going to stand before a holy God and give an account of how I spent every single second, every single minute, every single hour of my life. Take your Bible, please, turn with me to Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter number 18. Now, I don't know if Billy Graham was saved or not, but I can tell you this much. He was a traitor if he was. He was a coward. He loved money and he wanted popul popularity. He wanted a following. More than he loved the Word of God, more than he loved Jesus Christ. When you follow a man who rejects the, God, the doctrines of the Word of God, you ought to reject him. You, get, you, you see a man that has rejected God, the Word of God, the King James Bible, God has rejected him. I don't care how popular he is. I don't care how big a following he has. As a matter of fact, the more you're banned by the world, the higher my reputation of you is. You get kicked off of Twitter, my, my value of you have, has just gone up, amen. You get put in prison in fake book, my value of you has gone up. If you get taken off those social media platforms, my, my opinion of you has gone way up. Uh, this is not a popularity contest to see if we're in the most popular church in town. This, this is not a, a popularity contest of being the most popular person in church or the most popular person in your family, the most popular person at work, or you're the funniest, or you're the most knowledgeable, or you're the most intelligent. It ought to be said of you, oh, here comes that Bible-thumping person always talking about hell again, always trying to get me saved, always trying to tell me about Jesus. That's what people ought to think about you. Matthew chapter number 18. Verse number 7. Jesus Christ. These are a red letter edition now, man. Oh, as if the black letters don't matter, right? Woe unto the world because of offenses, for it must needs be that offenses come. But woe to that man by whom the offense cometh. Wherefore, if thy hand or thy foot offend thee, cut them off and cast them from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life halt or maimed rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into everlasting fire. This is the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, everlasting fire. Verse number nine. And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hell 
fire. Do you realize Jesus spoke more about hell than he did about heaven? Let me repeat that statement. Jesus spoke more about hell than he did about heaven. I'm not minimizing the love of God. I'm not minimizing the mercy of God. I'm not minimizing the forgiveness of God. I mean, the folks that most of the churches and most of the folks that teach that don't even believe that. Because if they believe that, they'd tell somebody about Jesus Christ being their Savior to save them from hell. But they don't believe in the love of God. They don't believe in the mercy of God. They don't believe in the forgiveness of God. Because the mercy of God is saving souls from hell. To be forgiven of our sins so we don't end up in hell. Let's keep reading. Verse number 10. The loving words of our loving Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Take heed that you despise not one of these little ones. For I say unto you that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is heaven. Huh. You better be careful how you treat people, especially the little ones. Jesus believes in the millstone, amen. The millstone doctrine, amen. Millstone theology, amen. To be, it's better to be cast into, have a millstone hung around your neck, cast into the sea before you offend one of these little ones. Matthew chapter 25. Matthew 25. Matthew chapter 25. And I know I'm skipping quite a few here, but we'll see how far we get this morning. Matthew 25. And we'll start reading in verse number 31. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another. Separate. Separates in the Bible. Separation. Amen. As a shepherd divided, he's very divisive. I hate using the word. They say divisive. It's divisive, okay? Everybody wants to change the, the pronunciation, the words, because we're so woke today, amen? He's a divider. Jesus divides the sheep from the goats, Amen. As a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his, it's interesting, on the right hand, but the goats on the left. That's it, very interesting. If you were here for that sermon I preached about seven, eight, ten years ago, right and left. Uh, look it up. Verse number 34. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, on the right hand. Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was unhungered, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in. Naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came unto me. We may be there some day, very soon. Verse 37. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee and hungered and fed thee or thirsty and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger and took thee in or naked and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick or in prison and came unto thee? And the king, capital K, if you have a King James Bible, pure Cambridge edition. And the king shall answer and say to them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, the left, the left, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire. These are the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. Prepared for the devil and his angels. See, hell was not prepared for men. Hell was not made for man. Hell was made for Satan, for Lucifer, and his fallen angels, the devils. But when a person rejects Jesus Christ, you are going to be part of the torment that Satan himself and all the lost devils and, and angels are going to be burning in hell forever. Those same people who have rejected Jesus Christ are going to end up in an eternity that was not originally prepared for man. It was originally prepared for Lucifer, Satan. But yet, lost people who have rejected God Almighty will end up in hell for all eternity. The ones on the left. He's going to depart from me. You curse it. Into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. If you drop down to verse number 46. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment. 
I don't think God will ever punish anybody. That's because you haven't read your Bible. I don't believe there's a place called hell. You, you've been talking to too many Jehovah's false witnesses and morons that don't read their Bible. Don't believe the Bible. You've been talking to too many church people that don't believe the Bible. There was a time that every single pulpit in America was preaching against hell. Preaching against and I don't care what denomination it was, man. But anymore, the pulpit's gotten cold, the churches have gotten cold, the hearts of the people have gotten cold. That's why you're upset and angry at somebody sitting in the same church pews that you're sitting in. That's why you're upset and angry and really hate people who come to church. And then we wonder why the world's going to pot. We wonder why the, the, the nation is falling down. I'll tell you why. It, the, the blame lays in the houses of God's people, ladies and gentlemen, who've gotten cold. These shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. Mark chapter number 9. Mark, the gospel of Mark, chapter number 9. It'd be good if you read the Bible with your own God-given eyeball. You don't have to believe me. Don't believe the man of God. Don't believe the pastor or the preacher. Read what God said. Mark chapter number 9. Mark chapter number 9. This is what you call hellfire and damnation preaching, ladies and gentlemen. That's what you call it. Mark chapter number 9. We don't rail against the socialists. We want to rail against everybody who hates God. How about you that you claim, hey, hypocrite, how about you claiming that you say you believe in God? You say you love God. Mark chapter 9. Fa la 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 la. Deck the halls with boughs of. Have a good time. Enjoy the Christmas spirit. Getting drunk. Kissing under the mistletoe. Go ahead. Hugging somebody else's wife. Hugging somebody else's husband. Go ahead. Have a good time. Go ahead, dance. Go, go ahead, rock and roll. Listen to your, your heathen music, man. Go ahead. Enjoy yourself. Go ahead. Drink, drink your liquor, your alcohol. Smoke your weed. Shoot your veins with alcohol. Enjoy yourself. But you're going to stand before a holy God who wrote this book. You're going to stand before a holy God and give an account of what's in this book. You can play games now, you can laugh and you can mock now, you can criticize, you can uh, brush it off all you want, but you're going to stand before a holy God like this book is written. And you're going to be there. You're not going to be able to cancel this reservation. You'll be there. And everybody will be watching. And all the secrets of the heart will be made manifest, the Bible says. Mark chapter number 9. Mark chapter number 9. Verse number 38, and John answered him, saying, Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name, and we follow, he followeth, us, followeth not us. And we forbade him, because he followeth not us. But Jesus said, Forbid him not, for there is no man which shall do a miracle in my name that can lightly speak evil of me. For he that is not against us is on our part. For whosoever shall give you a cup of water to drink in my name, because you belong to Christ, verily I say unto you, he shall not lose his reward. And whosoever shall offend one of these little ones that, would, that believe in me, it is better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck, and he were cast into the sea. And if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell. This is a red letter edition, by the way into the fire. Are you reading this? Do you have a Bible in the pew? Why don't you pull your Bible out and read it? Into the fire that never shall be quenched. Never. Where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. I taught this in a Bible study years ago. For those of you who are not here, you just recently be coming. I don't believe in evolution. I believe in devolution. In other words, man doesn't get better and better. Man's getting degrading worse and worse. And the Bible says in Psalm 22 that Jesus was a worm on that, on that cross, on the tree when he died. So was he a literal worm? You know what's going to end up in hell? Man's going to devolve to a red maggot state. You don't believe that. You read your Bible. 
And those lost rejected rejectors of Jesus Christ are going to degrade into a red maggot crawling all over each other, wailing and gnashing with their teeth in, for all eternity, where the worm dieth not. Jesus died on the cross as a worm, Psalm 22 says, to take your place so you wouldn't go to a place called hell to be a red maggot for all eternity. How can you reject that? How can you reject that love of God? How can you reject the merciful Savior says, I'll die for you so you won't have to go to hell to pay for your sins. Why would you reject that? Why would you say no to God? Where their worm dieth not. And the fire is not quenched. And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter a halt into life than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched. See, if you believe this, you'd be in church when the doors are open. See, if you, if you, if you believe this, you tithe. If you believe this, you support missionaries. If you believe this, you'd be faithful. If you believe this, you hand out gospel. My wife and I were down in Washington, D.C. You know why I went down there? We handed out a minimum of 6,000, maybe 8,000 tracts on Wednesday. And if I had another 50,000 tracks, they would have taken them, man. We were talking, talking to Brother Bruce just the other day. We were sitting there, uh, yesterday we were talking about it, and it was the most, one of the most surreal moments of my life. I'll be honest with you. You've heard me say this. I grew up, I was listening to my, my icon, idol was that queer faggot. Uh, I don't know what it is, Elton John. Had all his records, albums, memorized those songs. And while I'm handing out the gospel tracks, I hear him blaring Elton John's song, Tiny Dancer. They played it two or three times. I couldn't stop crying because all I can remember Elton John singing, mocking Christians, handing out tickets for golf. And as the people were passing me, I was handing out gospel tracks, listening to the song I was used to sing when I was lost on my way to hell. You can be right politically and burning in hell when you die, man. Right. Right. You can be voting for the right person and, and die burning in hell. I don't want to waste my time doing anything that's in vain. Verse 46, where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. Do you believe these verses or not? How can you have a cold heart reading this stuff, man? You hate someone that much that you want to see them burning in hell for all eternity? And you're not even grateful that you're saved? Saved from hell? Saved. You know what the word saved means? Saved from something. A savior saves. And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. Where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. Now watch this, verse number 49. Watch what it says. For everyone shall be salted with fire. It's God's barbecue. It's God's sacrifice. And every sacrifice shall be salted with salt. These are the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. Luke chapter number 17. Luke 17. Luke 17. Starting in verse number 20, when he was demanded of the Pharisees when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation, 
Neither shall they say, Lo here or lo there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. And he said unto the disciples, The days will come when ye shall desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and ye shall not see it. And they shall say to you, See here, or see ye there. Go not after them, nor follow them. For as the lightning that lighteneth out of the one part under heaven shineth unto the other part under heaven, so shall also the Son of Man be in his day. But first must he suffer many things and be rejected of this generation. And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they got stimulus checks. Yeah. As long as you got enough money, you know, as long as your 401k is okay, as long as you can go on vacation, as long as you can get a second car, as long as you have a second home, so as long as you're wearing nice clothes, who cares? Okay. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark. And the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise also, as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built it. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire. It rained fire and brimstone. You get fire and brimstone preaching, right? It rained fire and brimstone. Like it's going to happen during the tribulation period. It, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. In that day, he which shall be upon the housetop and his stuff in the house, let him not come down to take it away. And he that is in the field, let him likewise not return back. Remember Lot's wife. Whosoever shall seek to save his life shall lose it. And whosoever shall lose his life shall preserve it. I tell you, in that night there shall be two men in one bed. The one shall be taken, the other shall be left. Two women shall be grinding together, the one shall be taken and the other left. Two men shall be in the field, the one shall be taken and the other left. Let's close with Luke chapter 16. 2 Thessalonians 1.8, he's coming with flaming fire. Hebrews 1.7 says his ministers are a flame of fire. Ministers on fire. 2 Peter 3.7 says that he's reserved unto fire. Jude 7 says eternal fire. Jude 25 says others save pulling them out of the fire. Revelation 8.7 says hail and fire. Revelation 15, verse 2, the sea of glass mingled with fire. Revelation 20, verse number 9, fire came down from God. In Revelation 20, verse 10, the devil was cast into the lake of fire. In Revelation 21, 8, the lake which burned with fire for all liars. Luke 16, starting in verse number 19. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores. And desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell, he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeing Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they 
which would pass from hence to you cannot. Neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee, therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house, for I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come unto this place of torment. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, this is a lost man in hell arguing with the man of God. He's burning in hell. If somebody went back from the dead, they'll believe him. No, they won't, because you have all these charismatic Pentecostals that believe in fake, false miracles from the devil himself, and they don't believe the word of God. You can, yeah, sin. If we just brought somebody from the dead, somebody will believe. No, they won't. If you don't believe the book, the Old Testament, you ain't going to believe the New Testament. No. If you don't believe in Moses, you ain't going to believe in Jesus. And let me say, say all these Jews, all these synagogues, if, if they believe the Old Testament, they would get born again and saved right now. It's just proof that they don't, they don't believe the Old Testament. I don't care who they are. I don't care if they're Orthodox. I don't care if they're... Uh, uh, reformed. I don't care if they're uh, uh, the Hasidic. I don't care who they are. If you don't believe Isaiah 53 in the Old Testament, you're not going to believe any of it. He said, Nay, Father Abraham, if, if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. Verse 31. And he said unto them, if they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. These are the words of the Lord Jesus Christ about a real place called hell that lost people are going to right now. That lost people have died who have rejected Jesus Christ are burning in hell right now. They're screaming in torments. While we sit in our lovely homes, the comfort of AC and heat. Oh, is it a little chilly here this morning? Is it bothering you that the wind's kicking a little bit? Does it bother you that the temperature is so cold outside? Does it bother you when, when in the middle of summer in July and August it's so hot that you're sweating? that bother you? How, how can you read this book? And have a cold heart to other people is beyond me. I just don't understand it. How can you read this book? Uh, you're probably not reading the book. You're probably not reading the book. If you're reading it, you're doing it because of habit or force. Somebody's forcing you or pressuring you to read it. And you don't even believe what you're reading. When I was 21 years old and I got on my knees and trusted Jesus Christ to be my Savior, I believed it. This is not a game for me. It's not a show for me. This is my life. I've given myself for the propagation of the gospel. This church is, is only, the only mission to glorify and worship Jesus Christ is for the propagation of the gospel. That's what we're here for. That's why God left you here. Why would God leave you here after you got saved? But to tell others about Jesus Christ. God could have taken us home when we got saved, but God left us here for the only reason. You know how you glorify God? By bringing much fruit to the Lord Jesus Christ. You know how you worship Jesus Christ? By telling others about the Savior who saves from hell so they can go to heaven when they die. Everything else is in vain. We argue about what color the carpet ought to be, which side the organ or the piano ought to be. We, 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 we fight and we discuss about the most trivial things that are worthless. Just tell people about Jesus. Because there's a real hell. And when people die, they're going to a literal place called hell and then be cast into the lake of fire for all eternity. Let's all stand. Dear Heavenly Father, all of us are guilty to some extent of not sharing the gospel enough, not caring enough, not having a broken heart for loss. And dear God, the best thing we can ever take to heaven with us 
will be other souls that we've led to thee. All the time we spend at church is geared toward the winning of the lost. Everything that's said and done in this place ought to be geared to the winning of the lost. All the spiritual songs and the gospel songs and the hymns that we sing ought to be geared to the winning of the lost. All the preaching and the teaching from the book ought to be done for the winning of the lost. All the building up of the saints, of the encouraging, of getting through another rough week or another rough month or another rough year ought to be the focus because of the winning of the lost. Dear God, Lord, help us to get right with thee. Give us a soft heart. Give us a tender heart. Give us a heart to love people, please. To be compassionate before it's eternally too late before they take their last breath or before we take our last breath. Bless these dear folks for their faithfulness, Lord. Please bless the morning service to follow in Jesus' name. Amen.